So we are live and welcome to Rocket and Retire Rich with your workplace pensions. That sounds very exciting. What are we promising people today, Alan? Our big promise is to help you know the steps to taking control of your workplace pension. And depending on where you are with your your pensions, this could be worth anywhere to 50,000 to 400,000 pounds. Like this could be the most valuable workshop you ever go on. So take control of your pensions. That's what we're going to do. The stakes are high. I the love stakes it. are very high. Uh, in the UK, the state pension was introduced in 1908. Uh, it was for over 70s. So you had to be over 70 to get to it. So this current state pension age is 68. Well, that's pretty good compared. Uh, over 70, it was means tested, uh, which signifies that you had to be a certain level of poor to even get it. You got five shillings a week, the Ooh. princely sum of five <laughs> shillings a week. What does that mean? It means £38 in today's money. So your total was £38 a week. And then I was thinking, you had to be over 70. How long did people live in 1908? An interesting bit, the UK's life expectancy. In 1908, the average person lived 52 years. So... <laughs> So they didn't expect you to ever claim this. They expected like you'd be dead by the time you claimed it. So very, very few people ever got their state pension. And now, obviously, people are living much longer than that, thankfully. So in the UK, life expectancy last year was 82. So much higher than much uh, 52. Higher. And our retirement age, like we live to 82, we retire at 68. So the average person has a 14 year retirement. So the government has gone from not expecting anyone to ever get the pension to having to pay out 14 years for nearly everyone in the country, which is a huge amount. And the current state pension is about £204 a week, which is just over £10,000 a year. And you think, could you live on £10,000 a year? Is this going to provide for you in your retirement? Is that enough? Yeah, so please put in the chat, could you live on ten grand a year? Uh, for the people who use dollars, that's a $12,500 a year. Uh, US dollars. US dollars. What's that in New Zealand dollars? I have no idea what that is in New Zealand dollars. Um, yeah. No, says Angie. Hell no, says the... Not in the UK, says SRF. Maybe if you move to Thailand. No. Missy on YouTube says no way. Lauren says no lol. She is laughing <laughs> at the idea that you could live on 10 grand a year. Karen says no. There's <laughs> lots of no's in the audience, Alan. So what, what do we do about this? Well, we did some research to work out what you need for a comfortable retirement. This is uh, according to the Pension and Lifetime Savings Association. They said for a couple, you need 54 grand a year. Uh, that seems quite a lot to us, but anyway, we'll go with it. They said for an individual, you need 37 grand a year. And this was for like a nice lifestyle, wasn't yeah. it? It was, you know, holidays, present like money to have gifts for family and friends and living in a nice place and having sort of eating out every now and again. So this is this is what they meant by comfortable. So you're living a good life. And when you look at it for an individual, if you get 10 grand from the state pension, you're missing 26 grand to have a comfortable life. And if you're a couple, it's even worse. Like you get 20 grand from the state pension, but you're missing 33 grand. Uh, where do these extra thousands of pounds come from? How do you fund your retirement? How are you going to have any? Because if you rely on a state pension, you are screwed. And the thing we've come to realize is no one is coming to save you. No one is coming to save you. You are not going to have a uh, knight in shining white armour come and save you. You have to provide for your own retirement. And in the UK and in most Western countries, if you've made it past the accident hump of 18 to 20 year old, where we lose lots of people in car accidents and drinking, your chances of making it to retirement are very good. So you better take care of this because... Even young people like Lucy are going to make it all the way to retirement. So you've got to look after yourself. And you've got to invest for your future to make sure you have enough. So I'm curious to know, do you consider yourself an investor already? Are you already an investor? Put it in the chat. 
on YouTube or Zoom, or please comment if you're watching on Catch Up on YouTube. What are you already investing? Is this today? part yes. of your identity? I think what we're asking. Like, yeah. Do you identify as an investor? Got lots of yes. Davinda Unlikely says yes. Unlikely says Sarah. Ellie says yes. Oh, I like this. So you know you are an investor, which is awesome. Ivan says yes. Not yet, says Catherine. Not yet, says Catherine, which is interesting because if you said not yet or no, like Alex Payne said not yet, Paula Errol said not yet, Karen said not yet. If you said no or not yet, you're probably wrong. You're probably wrong because if you have a job, you have been auto-enrolled in a pension scheme. In the UK, you don't opt into a pension scheme. You have to opt out. So you automatically get put in to the company pension scheme. What that means is if you've had a job within the last 10 or 15 years, you will have a pension with one of those employers, unless you opted out, and you will be an investor. So when Lucy says not yet, Lucy, you probably already are an investor. You probably already have a company pension somewhere that we need to optimise. Catherine says that's true. I think exactly. she changed her yeah. mind. She you is. I think that even if you're not having, you don't work for a company now where you have a pension. If you're in your forties, fifties, there's probably some point in your life where you have worked for a company, and possibly it might be a small amount, but there's probably an investment there, and that is your responsibility to be investing. You have something invested. You already are. And what we want to know is: Have you thought about these investments that you've been auto put in? Or are you blindly accepting the default? Exactly. Lucy says, do you have to work a minimum amount of hours for this? I think there are I some rules so. around that, whether you're part time, full time, but everyone should get a pension. And that's what the government is heading towards. So we ought to check with previous employers. Uh, moving on from that, you've probably got opted into a bunch of pensions. Then the question is, are you accepting the default fund that they've put you in? Because some recent statistics from the UK government says that 99% of people just accept the default. So even if you have a pension, most people go, well, I don't really know what that's about. And they just accept the default. So we wanted to know if that's you. If you're in a company pension, did you choose the funds? Did you thoroughly review and understand the options available and then choose uh, did you pick some random funds that sounded interesting, which some of Katie's colleagues from when she was working, that was how they did it. They were yeah. like, I'll have this one and this one. I was like, Mike, what have you done with the company pension? What have you invested in? He said, I just picked some random things that looked interesting. I've no idea what they are. And I thought, OK, that sounds fun. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then most people end up just in the default, uh, just as those answers come in on youtube please scan the code and fill this in it helps oh, us to understand the data and katie's put the link in the chat so we would really like to know that i think as well not just your current pension as well when we're asking you this because there's all the default options that you had from the past as well so of those as well are you just in the default one and haven't looked to know what that default option is alex payne says what if you're self-employed you don't automatically get put in a pension if you're self-employed. You have to open a SIP for you, which we'll get on to. I'm curious, Alex, maybe have you had jobs in the past for which you might have had pensions paid into as well? Exactly. Catherine says just accepted the default. Uh, Helen says employer's pension is nest, but wasn't, but unsure what it's invested in. And that's what most people are. is like, I know I've got a pension. I know I'm in it, but they don't really know where it is. And if we don't take control of this stuff, we're just blindly going into the future and heading towards a future where we don't know if we have the money or not. So currently on the poll, about 61% of people said I'm invested in the default fund and I don't really know what it is. Uh, that's actually better than the standard population. Yes. So give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> uh, you're doing better than standard population. But hopefully by the end of today, we can fix that. Because you've got comments like Isabel said, I have three workplace pensions. And of those three workplace pensions, 
Sorry, I moved the screen, Alan. You moved the chat. Uh, I have three workplace pensions, no idea what they are doing. The language uses baffled me. That's most people's experience. So let's see if we can help you work out what it is and go through it, because you need to take control of this. And we've got loads more resources as well as tonight's workshop, lots of other bits that we can help you to start to understand and we'll come on to what those are as we go. Uh, Catherine says, I have an appointment with Pension Wise in April to look into these issues. Yeah, we'll get on to that and definitely have a look through all of these. But if you ever want to retire, you need to take control of it. And we're not just talking about normal retirement age. We're talking lots of people are ending up having to work beyond 68 because they just can't afford to retire. You've been given the responsibility for your pensions. However, you haven't been given the education. And that's the key bit. People have been put in charge of their financial future, but never taught how to do it. Because it used the, the out of date thing, wasn't it? That you would have the company pension for life, and you wouldn't didn't need to do anything with it, and you would just would be looked after in retirement. But that's shifted now. We are responsible each and every one of us to look after our retirement. But no one's told you how to do it, and that's the the place that most people are in. That's the place we were in before we started mm -hmm. learning about this. But we are here to help. We're not going to do it for you, of course, but we're going to help you and educate you and teach you how to do it step by step. That's what today is about and a lot of the other content that we've got as well. But let's start today with what we've got now. Exactly. Uh, pension Wise has been mentioned a couple of times. Dee said, I found Pension Wise left me confused, didn't give me clear direction. But you don't need Pension Wise. We'll come on to what to do with your pensions as we go. Uh, the previous instalments of these workshops have been about increasing the gap between your income and your spending. And that is what we then take and invest in pensions and ICEs and SIPs to grow so that you can retire. So everything we've been doing up until this point has built to deliver the money that you need to actually start investing on this. Before we get into all this, we have a quick message from our lawyers, which I don't know why, but our lawyers look friendlier this week That's than nice, past don't weeks. They? More smiley. So we are not financial advisors. This is not financial advice. We are not regulated. We are not trained financial advisors. We're never going to try and sell you anything. You make your own decisions, sharing your opinions and ideas. These ideas may not continue to work for us or for you. You are 100% responsible for your financial future, which is both exciting and scary. And there are no guarantees here, None except Lucy, for the money back guarantee for the course. If you didn't like it, you can have your money back that you paid almost instantly. <laughs> so, Katie, what's the plan for tonight? So tonight we're going to we're going to start right from the beginning because it's not all. It's not obvious what a pension even is. So we're going to start right from the beginning, explain what a pension is, what the different types are, and then it's going to be time to start doing some detective work to work out what you already have and then work to understand and optimise what you already have as well. And then the final section is, will I ever get to retire? Uh, <laughs> it might be a cheery <laughs> note at the end. Let's see what happens. <laughs> That's the plan. So please make notes as we go through. The video is obviously on catch up as well. So jot down the actions you're going to take as you get going. And we will go through all of that. So section one, what is a pension? A pension is a regular payment made to people over retirement age. So it's a regular amount of money that comes to you, normally comes from one of three places the government, such as a state pension, um, yeah, your employer, so maybe it's a government employer or an actual employer, or a private pension, also known as you. Oh, so it's not you, Alan, that's paying into everyone's pensions? No, no, I'm paying into my <laughs> own pension, you are responsible for yours. Got it, just to be clear. Or a combination of these, because you might have worked for three years for the NHS and have that pension. You might have worked for five years for a private company, and then you might have topped up your own pension. So it can be a combination. Love that. So that's number one. What is a pension? So then let's go on to types of pension. There's two main types. Firstly, the uh, DB, defined benefit. That's where someone, so the government or who you work for, says, I promise you, Alan Donegan, a certain amount in retirement. I promise that when you get to retirement, I'll give you £10,000 a year, £23,000 a year, 
five pounds a month, whatever it is, but they're promising you a specific amount in retirement. And these are also called final salary pensions, which is normally like, here's your final salary. You'll get a percentage of this. And where do you get these from? Well, there are some private company pensions that are DB, but that's extremely rare now. But like some of the like really old British employers like BT and some insurance companies, they did have these types of pensions. They're extremely rare now. Most companies do not offer these because Funnily enough, they don't want to be uh, responsible. responsible. <laughs> uh, the biggest provider of these is the public sector, National Health Service, police, teachers, councils. They provide those sort of pensions. Oh, yeah. Joel says forces pensions too. So the military and. Exactly yeah. right, Joel. And then the final one a form of this is the state pension. Uh, that is a defined benefit pension because you know you are going to get 10 grand a year in retirement from that. So that's defined benefit. The benefit is the amount you're getting at the end. The other one is defined contribution. Now, what this means is the amount you put in, the amount they put in for you is the bit that's defined. And there is zero promise of what you will get at retirement. No promise whatsoever. We promise to contribute X, but whatever it grows to, it grows to. And that's why you need to take control of these things. So there's two main ways that these come about. Firstly, from company that you work for, the private companies where your employer puts you in, in these auto-enrolled pensions and they say, we'll put in X, you put in Y, and it grows to what it grows to. And that's what you'll get at retirement. And the second one is a SIP or a self-invested personal pension. And Alex was saying, I'm self-employed, what do I get? You get one of these if you set it up for yourself. And most self-employed people never actually bother to do it, which is a big challenge in our country at the moment. So let's go through these in a little bit more detail. State pension, what should happen, the government collects your national insurance contributions, it then invests them and then gives it out as your pension at the end. What has happened in reality, because the government never really thought they were going to pay out the pension, <laughs> is they don't have any investments in the middle. There is nothing. And they are literally taking your national insurance contributions right now, if you're working, and passing them straight to the pensioners. So there is no middle bit. They literally take your cash and pass it straight through, um, which is why some of us get concerned, like, can they keep doing this? How's it going to work? Um, but that's how that one works. That's a state pension. And then how do defined benefit pensions work? Because a lot of people come to us and say, oh, I want to understand how my defined benefit pension is invested and if I can optimise that. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. So with these types of pensions, you contribute and your employer contributes. There's some investments in the middle and then you get these guaranteed pension payments at the end. And that pot in the middle is just a group pot for everyone Whoever your employer is, so normally the government through the NHS and police and so on, they're responsible for mm -hmm. it. They're the ones that have promised to pay you this. Therefore, they're the ones that have gone about investing it in some way. And you're not in charge. There's no control. You can't go and say, hang on a minute. How are you investing this money? I really think you should put it in a broad based index fund. There's no, <laughs> no control. You can't do anything about it. Um, and it's not your responsibility. However, it is your responsibility to understand what you're going to be mm -hmm. promised and whether that's going to be enough for you and whether you need to supplement. So when we say no responsibility, we're saying that the way that it's invested is not your responsibility. It's still absolutely your responsibility to understand, if you have one of these, how it fits in the whole puzzle of figuring out your retirement. Catherine says, I feel safe already. Uh, that's why lots of people want these pensions is because it feels safe because you have a guarantee at the end. However, that safety normally comes at a cost. You get a worse outcome normally at the end, as opposed to if you managed it yourself. And the managing yourself bit, you put your contributions into the pension. Your employer puts contributions into a pension, which in the UK, they are legally required to give and contribute to your pension. That goes into your pot, which you manage. It grows to what it grows to. And then you have to manage it and take it out at the end and be responsible for it. So kind of you are in charge with this. It's your investment pot 
and you have to manage it down at the end. But the benefit of that is you can do a really good job quite simply and have a lot of money in the future. Lots of people are scared of this one because they're like, I don't want the responsibility. I need to leave it with someone else. If you take control, it's unbelievable what you can do. The thing here as well, so this diagram is as if the company that you're currently working for, so that's why we've got the your employer's contributions on here. You'll also maybe have various other pots from previous employers where you're not putting any contributions in anymore and neither is your employer because you don't work there anymore, but you'll still have this pot that you're responsible for figuring out how that fits again into your puzzle of retirement income. So this is your responsibility. If you don't have anything outside the state pension, you will end up in poverty in retirement. Like we need to do something today that future you will be grateful for. And that's what Katie and I have always said. We need to work hard to look after future Katie and Alan. And I want you to look after future Lucy, future Davinda, future Joel, future K-Mac. Let's do something today to look after future you. And you can do that regardless of how old you are right now. Like it's never too late to start figuring this stuff out. So you might be thinking, well, it's it's too late for me. I'm already in my 50s, 60s. I'm coming up on retirement. It's never too late. Whilst you still have breath in you, there is still time to figure this out. I would also say it's never too late. Even if you're into your 70s and claiming for your pension, you can still optimise it. So I don't care how old you are, you can improve your situation. I love that, Alan. Thank you. Uh, it's true. <laughs> so we're going to focus today mainly on defined contribution and employer pensions, because that's what most people have. And it's what you actually have control over. Lots of people then will go, well, I'm in the NHS or the police or whatever it is. Anyone can have a private pension. So even if you have a police pension, an NHS pension, you can still open your own SIP. You can still have a pension that you're in control of. So don't write it off. Think about the whole picture and you can still do a huge amount to increase your income in retirement and help you to retire early. And when we say private pension and when we say SIP, they're the same thing. Yes. SIP is self-invested personal pension. It's just a pension that you look after yourself. It's not attached to any employer. It's yours. It's private in that sense. Doesn't mean like private, like I'm going to keep it secret. <laughs> it's private. Claire says, I don't know what my hubby has. Uh, my hubby has Asperger's and works, but I need to sort out the money. I need help to work out what to do. Claire, there's a whole section of this about uncovering what pensions you already have, which I'd love you to go through. Then we can uncover what your hubby has, work with him, and then work out how to optimise it. Which we're coming on to in this workshop. So we've got you covered. Exactly. Right. Moving on. Defined benefit pensions. What we actually need to do within this. It's your job to understand it. If you don't, we can ask your employer. You can do your own learning. We just need to get as much information we can about what you already have. And don't leave that retirement up to chance. Let's take action now by learning about it. So the first section of this bit, number three, is the detective work. Because we need to uncover what you've already got and really understand it. And if you ever message Katie and I about your pensions, we will ask you the same <laughs> questions every time which is who's it with what's it invested in what are the fees uh, we ask the same questions over and over again so that's what we're going to help you train to understand that's what you need to know to manage it so how do you go about doing this well there is help available so there's a government service called the pension tracing service that can help you like you give them your national insurance number and they've got ways to then find where your pensions were with in the past because this is where we're talking about where you've been with various employers maybe in your 40s 50s 60s you might have worked for 8 10 12 15 different companies mm -hmm. you're like where do I start with understanding all of this stuff which is why the government has this service but Alan what what's the word of warning with this one uh there is a reason that there is a picture <laughs> of the devil on the slide uh and my business partner Simon used this service and the government sent him to St. James's Place afterwards. That was the advisor he was given. And for anyone who's followed our content, St. James's Place is 
evil, their fees are ridiculous and their performance is bad. So use the service to uncover where your pensions are, but do not trust the advisors they give you. And I want to be so clear about that. Do not trust the advisors they give you afterwards. Make up your own decisions. Just because you're going to a government service, like they've outsourced it and found someone to do it free for them, that person that's doing it free for them wants to earn money out of you. So it comes with a huge warning. Okay. So Please put something <laughs> in chat to let me know you got that. Put uh, like SJP thumbs down or something like that to make sure I need to know you understand this one because it's a huge one. Um, cool. So there's the pension tracing service. Got it, says D. Perfect. SRF Thank heard you, it Dean. loud and clear. Lauren Johnson says, boo, SJP. So they've heard us. They've Perfect. Heard so yeah, by all means, use this service, but you don't then have to invest with them. You just use the service, gather the information, which the other way of doing it, or even if you use that service, is you think, well, how do I do this? Do I have to keep this all in my head? I had employer A and then employer B and then employer X, Y, Z. Remember I worked with them in the 80s and them in the 2000s, early, early noughties. Make a table and I'm going to show you exactly what to put in the table. So you go through each and every of your old employers, all the different pensions that you have. And then just, when you see it written down, then you can start to systematically go through it. So these are the different columns that we suggest that you have so, so, and you might do this by going through your CV, through your resume to see when, where did I used to work? Exactly. Which like, that's probably possibly the best place to start. Even an old one, if you've been self-employed for many years. So put when it was, so maybe 98 to 2004, you worked for Pineapples R Us. You know that the pension provider, so the person that like administered the pension, they call it like the company that they normally would outsource it to was Standard Life. What funds it was invested in, I've got no clue. I'm going to need to dig out my paperwork. What were the fees? I don't know. And then this one at the end, is there a low-cost broad-based index fund option is to say, okay, regardless of what I have invested in now, is there the option of something that is a way to optimize the investment? Is there stuff available that I could move my investment over to, which is something that you can do in any of your pensions that you have control over you choose where it's invested and we'll come on to understanding how that all fits together in a little bit so that first line that was your first employer and then you just start to fill in the table again so the so after you worked for pineapples R us you went to work for excel academy you've got no idea where they were investing um and so on and you just start to build this table up line by line and it really helps you to see it very clearly you can see where the gaps are so you can see where you need to start filling in. I've been talking for a while now, Alan. Please say something. I love that. A uh, couple of comments that I just wanted to highlight. Nita said, I've been with SJP since 2016. Should I worry? Nita, I'm afraid to say yes. They have very high fees and a bad service. They also have exit fees and they're currently under investigation by the Financial Conduct Authority for a lot of what they've done. So like, if you are with St. James's Place, start to learn about them and please consider moving from them. And we have um, numerous people that have come on Rebel Finance School have been through the process of changing from SJP. If that's something that you want to do. Um, Join the group, know, ask yeah. the question. It's actually in the group many times. Uh, you can just set up a different SIP, say with Vanguard or Interactive Investor and transfer out. Um, she said, like, how do I get out? I think it's also to understand, is it a pension? Is it ISA? Is it both as well? So I think gather all the paperwork would be your first step to understand what you have, when you started it. Yeah. How much money it. you've got, all the details, and then ask them for what's called a transfer value, uh, how much you would get if you transferred it all out. And Lauren said, I just contacted all my old employers and asked them what pension provider they use then contacted the companies to see if I had one or not. That's fantastic. That's basically what we're talking about right now. Um, Nita says, just pension, but quite a big pension. Need to get all the data from them. Come on Rebel Finance School and like you're going to want to transfer based on fees alone and you will work out why in just a minute. We'll come on to that. So stick with us through the workshop. We're coming on to it. Angie says, can you please remind me, is a SIP the same as a 401k in the US? Yeah. Yes. 
Perfect. So if you don't like tables or Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> Katie did an entire course on how to use Excel uh, to create simple tables. So scan the QR code, uh, find the link for it, have a look at it and go on the Excel course. If you don't like tables, it's a really useful skill to have. Moving on, what we're doing is we're looking for clues. So time to dig out the pile of letters you failed under deal with it later and look for all the different clues about your pensions. One thing I do want to say is use the phone. So many people we speak to say, oh, I emailed my pension company, they never replied. Call them. You are literally paying their fees to manage your pension. Ring them, pester them. If they don't know the answer, keep going. Like You've got to get quite tough to get what you need out of this. And when we're saying doing this detective work, looking through your piles of paperwork, the whole purpose is to fill in that table that we talked you through to understand current fees, what it's invested in and what it could be invested in. So collect all the details, even what fund it's invested in. The what fund it's invested in is called a KID, Key Investor Information Document, or a fund fact sheet. You need to find those they're the same thing, aren't they? It's yeah. just different words for the same thing. Work out how much you got invested, what the fees are, and what any matched contributions are. That's what you need to do. And I have a little poll for you to answer. Before this course, what did you do with your annual pension statements? What did you do with them? So there's a little poll for you to answer. Please vote in the poll. We would really appreciate that. And fill out... Like, what did you actually do with them? Uh, did you put them in a folder with the others? Did you recycle it? Did you skim read it? Or did you thoroughly read it and understand it? So please vote on that now. Uh, and the same if you're on YouTube, please scan that QR code. Katie is putting the link in the chat right now for it. Please fill that out and tell us what did you actually do with your pension statement? Uh, so far, about 60% of us are saying skim, read it, and then file it. Um, a few of us, which I'm really proud of, are thoroughly reading it and understanding it. Hopefully that's after our course. Um, Got slightly different answers on YouTube through the Google form. So just over half people put it in a folder with the others. Yes, which, which is, is what I used to do. What everyone does it, yeah. Helen says filed it without reading it. Paula says don't get pension statements. Um Maybe you could ask for them. Hopefully you get one a year. They might email you now. Um, that's what my one does. They just email me once a year and say, your statement is ready to read. Um, and then it's up to you to go and log in and find the, the statement. Exactly. Claire says, didn't know we had one. Ask them about it. You should get a pension statement once a year. And we need to know how much you're saving for the future. So we're going to win the poll. Love it. And keep going on this so moving on to the next bit we did a whole workshop on how to read those statements once you get them once you've uncovered them once you've gathered that information uh, we did a bonus workshop at the end of rebel finance school last year so please go and watch that and it will help you to understand it because a lot of the statements even though they come from different providers they have very similar sections so once maybe you have five six seven different pension things and it can feel very overwhelming but once you understand and can read the first one the next ones get so much quicker because they do have very similar layout sections there's legislation that says exactly what needs to be in them so you do have that like it's a steep learning curve to start with but once you're in you're like yeah I got this and the next one looks very similar and that workshop is what that's all about exactly and then Emma Curtis said the pension statements made a good fire afterwards <laughs> Uh, which did make me smile. At least you're using them to heat your house. Oh, yeah, that's quite a good uh, frugal hack, isn't it? OK, so once we've gathered all the details, then we need to understand and optimise what you already have. So this bit is just pay attention to this, have it in your mind. And maybe after you've gathered all the details, maybe you rewatch this section to be able to understand it again. But we need to optimise all this. So here's your checklist. The things we're going to optimise are... A, fees, how much you're paying for this stuff. Yeah, because unlike, well, in the UK anyway, bank accounts and cash savings accounts and cash ISAs, 
normally you don't pay any bank fees, do you? Whereas when it comes to investing, no matter what it is, there will be fees involved. And the idea is to keep those fees as low as possible because there are inevitably fees involved with this. Exactly. Number two is what investments you have. We can optimize that. We can optimize your contributions. Are you getting the full matched contributions from your employer? And then we can optimize the provider of your pension. This will take effort. It is not easy. Sometimes they purposefully make it difficult so that you don't change. Like You need to really work at this and we just want to prepare you. We're going to have to work through this to make sure it happens. You will be so pleased you do because everyone is better off than never bothered Ned, who just didn't do anything to optimise his stuff. And there's some degree of persistence involved as well, because mm -hmm. Alan said, like, use the phone. Sometimes they try and get rid of you, don't they? And they don't really have a good answer. And you can tell that they're just making it up. So you need to repeatedly follow up and keep on them. I was going to use the word hounding. Then I thought against it. And then I'm going to go for it. Hound them. Yes. You are paying them to organize your pension they should provide you with a service. So do call them and take it. So let's look at these sections. Section one, fees. If there was one thing you got from tonight's workshop, this is the section. Fees are at different levels. So they like to make this confusing so you don't actually know how much you're paying. But you have three different levels of fees. You have the fees on your platform. So your platform might be Vanguard, Interactive Investor, St. James's Place, Wealthify, Scottish Widows. Like There are hundreds of different providers, standard life of pension. So you have your provider. A couple of the other normal ones through employers are Legal and General, mm -hmm. L&G, Aviva. Can't think of any others, but those are, the, those are the ones you might start to see on your pension statements. Claire says, why do they make it so hard for people? <laughs> because if it's difficult, you need a financial advisor. Uh, and then that's an entire industry that relies on this stuff being complex. Whereas actually it could be really simple, which is just open a Vanguard SIP, invest in a broad-based index fund and move on with life. But they make it so complex and they also hide their fees in some of this. So you've got platform level. Level two is account. So you might have an ISA, uh, individual savings account, which is kind of like a, a Roth in America. You might have SIP, which is your self-invested personal pension. Uh, and then you might have a general account at the end. There's probably one to add here as well, isn't there? That your employer's a pension through your employer as well. Yes. And then the final level is like what this stuff is actually invested in. Like, is there an index fund? Is there actively managed fund, bonds, cash with interest? Like all of the funds within your account will have a fee. So if you think back to that table that we're trying to build up, we had entries for both the platform and the fund in here. It, I, I'd called it provider in the table, but provider or platform are the same idea. So it's, okay, who is the provider? So that's that thing at the top. Is it with um, Aviva, Aviva, LNG, Wealthify, whoever it is? And then what is it invested in, which is this fun thing at the bottom? What is it invested in? And for each of your pension pots, we need to understand both of those, the platform and the fund. So here's your mission, just to make it easy. Your mission at platform level is to minimise fees. You want to pay as little as possible for a reasonable service. Because actually fees, there's fees at different levels as well. So there will be potentially, sometimes not with pensions, a platform fee, as well as the other types of fees that we're coming on to. Then at account level, which we were actually talking to this about with SRF just beforehand, was at account level, your job is to minimise taxes. So if you've got a pension, you're already minimising taxes because it's a tax advantaged account. But that's your job at this level to use ISAs, SIPs to minimise taxes. And then at the fund level, your idea is to minimise fees as well. So there will be platform fees and there will also be fund fees. That's the way that the industry works. And then to choose a global index fund that's low fees based around the world, global, not choosing one company, not choosing one industry, not choosing one country, uh, avoiding investing in weird stuff. 
exactly. Jeff Smith says, good evening. Sorry I'm late. I couldn't find my pineapple. Uh, <laughs> we're glad Jeff has found his pineapple and turned <laughs> up. And Nita says, my financial advisor works for SJP. Uh, we're just about to reveal why that is and what happens to those fees. So, Katie, tell us about active versus passive funds and your experience. My experience. So, I was this one I used to work for Deloitte. I used to think I was so important. I'd sit there and if the phone rang, which actually never happened, I used to think I was important because I wasn't really. The phone rang and I was like, Katie Donegan, because <laughs> I thought that's what fancy people do to answer the phone. And there's this guy on the other end and he said, have you thought about investing money for the future? And I said, yes, yes, I have. And I have no idea where to start or what I'm doing or how to do it. How does it even work? So I set up an appointment to go to his offices and uh, he sold me some investments to put into my ISA and my pension, which these were the fees. And I thought, hmm, this is interesting. Are these, are these, this seemed reasonable to me. So he said, okay, first of all, just to have the account with us, we're going to charge you 0.6% which is called the platform fee. So they charge you 0.6%. And most people think, oh, 0.6%. Well, that's not very much. It's less than 1%. That's not very much. Uh, and then he said, for the funds that we're going to put your money in, do you remember we had the platform fees and then we had the fund fees and you kind of got the, the pension in the middle. He said the fund fees will be 1.61%. And I thought, oh. That's... It's only 1%? Just seems okay. And then... For every uh, £100 that you put in, we'll take £3 of that. They're called the initial investment fee of 3%. So anytime you put money in, we'll just take a little bit because, you know, we're doing all this hard work for you and you're so lucky that we're looking after your money. So this is what happens. And the advisors, Nita said my financial advisor works for SJP, like they get this initial investment fee and they get some of your fees for investing it. So that's basically how they fund their nice cars and their lifestyle is living off your fees. And then we learned all about um, investing in passive funds. So active funds is where someone who thinks they're very clever is going to go and invest your money for you choose which companies to buy versus passive funds is where they say, we don't know how companies are going to do. where we say that. We don't know how companies are going to do. Exactly. So we won't choose which fund, which companies to invest in. We will just invest all of them in a passive fund that lists all of them. So active is where someone's trading for you. Passive is where no one is trading for you and it just follows the market. That's the difference. So we discovered and learned for ourselves how to invest. We got rid of this guy because his fees were absolutely ridiculous. And then we worked out if we had carried on investing this way with this financial advisor in these funds, what would have happened versus changing path and going with these passive funds? What would have happened? And in general, active means worse performance and higher fees. They charge you more for it. And so we worked this out. And I would like to say, to work this out, our friend Matt came round. Uh, he's one of the smartest people we know. He got a first from Cambridge University. Katie's pretty good with figures. I'm quite clever. And I'm not dumb. Uh, but the three of us took about three hours to figure this out, just to understand their documents. It is crazy just to even understand this stuff. Um, so the impact on £10,000, if Katie did invest £10,000, what would it be worth after 10 years? So if we'd have stayed with the fancy advisor in the active fund, after 10 years of investing, our £10,000 would be worth, drum roll please, how much do you think it was worth? 5 million, 10 million, any ideas? How much do you think it's worth? Lucy is like shrugging, I have no idea. What do you think? Was it worth more? You'd hope it was 11 worth more. says D. D says 11. Uh... <laughs> Less says at a dollar. 20 says Andy. X says McFlips. Does that mean nothing? Claire says Claire seven. seven. Jo uh, Lewis Joseph says... says J Joseph Lewis. Lewis Joseph says 21. Uh, it's actually worth, after 10 years, £9,534. So he lost us 500 quid. Uh... <laughs> And in that period, we paid two and a half grand in fees. 
So we paid him two and a half grand to lose 500 quid. And that's not even when you take into account inflation, because every year your money is worth less. Like, it's insane. So then we thought, well, how much of it is the platform fees? Mm -hmm. So this is, so then we thought, okay, let's assume we kept the same fund, but we got rid of their expensive platform. So what if you could invest in those funds in a different platform? How much would we have after 10, after 10,000 years? <laughs> after 10 years, if we had invested 10,000 pounds. And we would have had 10,280 pounds. Uh, so we would have reduced our fees for about 700 quid and we would have profited by those 700 quid. Like it makes sense. You pay slightly less fees you get slightly more in your account. And then the final thing we did was like, well, okay, what if we'd have invested how we know now in a Vanguard broad-based index fund? So we just chose the Vanguard developed world, excluding the UK was the fund we chose. And we're like, okay, change to a low cost platform and a low cost passive index fund. What do you think that would have been worth after 10 years? So we just put 10 grand in, leave it and see what happens at the end of 10 years after a decade how much would it yeah worth? what would you have left after a decade do you think we would have made money 15 says the 31 says claire claire you're actually quite impressively close to binder says 17 rayhan says 15 it was actually thirty-four thousand, and we would have only paid 391 pounds in fees so like that is insane so when we're talking about optimizing your pensions, if you just optimized a 10 grand pension, you might be 24 grand better off and save yourself like 2,200 pounds in fees. It is insane. And we did a final calculation. Yeah, Kate says that's shocking. Kate, wait till this figure. We did a final calculation to say, if we'd have carried on with this strategy instead of changing like we did, we would not have been financially independent. We would be 315 grand worse off, which is just insane. That's a lot of money. Yeah. I'd rather have the 315 grand instead of giving it to a swanky advisor in a suit. Uh, if you want to see, there's Katie crying on the slide because she's poor. Um, but like scan the QR code. You can see all our sums and what we're doing. Like it is insane how much of a difference fees and the investments you choose will make. That's why I said at the start of this workshop, this workshop might be worth 400 grand to you. It could be worth more over your lifetime if you optimise this stuff. Isabel says, why does anyone do it then? Um, why does anyone use a financial advisor or one of these places with high fees like St. James's Place? It's two it's, reasons. Firstly, it's because we're not educated are we we don't understand how to invest so someone comes along and says don't worry Isabel I'll take care of this all for you don't you worry your pretty little head I'm going to look after it for you 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 obviously don't know what you're doing so let me do it for you I'll just take one two three percent of your money and then you can have what you have at the end and let me take that um responsibility away from you because it's like we've been given this responsibility we don't understand how to do it they come along and you think, yes, great, a professional. They'll do it for me. Let and I me, can trust them because they me, wear a suit. Exactly. What's the say? Was that one of your two reasons? That was. It was like the fear of not doing it yourself, the security of having an advisor doing it. And the other thing is quite often it's the promise of gain. So quite often the advisor says, uh, like, I will do really well for you. And they promise you that they will increase your money. So it like gets taken away out of your control and they think they can do a better job, like Alexandra just said in the chat. Yeah, and, and Lauren said, because people that use these high fee investment places don't understand how those fees impact the investments because they don't have a context to understand that 1% is a high fee. It doesn't sound high, but it really, really is. And it, like, how would you know out of context? Oh, okay, 1%. Fair enough. But that compound. So as your money is supposed to be compounding, increasing, if you're taking out 1% of that, not only like your money is not going to be able to compound at the same rate. So let's provide context for you as you look at the fees of your current pensions. The question is, are my fees high? Let's set this into context. Number one, if your fees are more than 0.7%, move, go somewhere else 
Like if your fees are one percent, one and a half percent, two percent, like Katie was paying two point two one percent, that is criminal. Like Nita, check your fees at St James's Place. I guarantee they're high. But if your fees are over 0.7, we would get out. And we're talking sort of a combination of the platform um, and fund. Yeah. If they're kind of like somewhere in the middle, 0.4 to 0.7, that's okay. Like, it's not too bad. The lower you can get it, the better it will be because it means more of your money is kept by you and will be growing. So if it's under 0.4, that's where it's at. I have a question, Alan. Doesn't shouldn't if I pay more, do I not get more? Do I not get like a better service? And they're going to do a better job for me. So is it worth it in some ways to to pay for these people that you know know what they're doing and are going to get me a better return? Is that how it works? Uh, no. Investment is one of the only games in the world where you get less the more you pay for. Everyone thinks if you pay more for a bottle of wine, you get a nicer bottle of wine. Investment is only one of the only things in the world where you actually get less the more you pay. The lower the fees, the better your performance will be over the long run. And there's a lot of studies that have shown that the only statistically significant measure of whether a fund will do different uh, do well over the long run is how much it costs you to invest in it. So if you had to pick one item to choose a fund on it would be the fees that would be it and joel said you're paying for their shiny suit and shiny car yes you they have to live off your investments that's what they do well and they get paid whether your money goes up or down they get paid a percentage of what you have there there's no normally no um performance based thing it's not like well if i do better than i've promised i'm going to do for you i get paid more no. Well, actually, sometimes they do do that, but only if they do well. If they do worse than expected, they don't give you some of your money back. No, they don't. They don't. So let's move on. So that's the first section is fees. We really wanted to understand the importance of that. If there was one thing to choose, it would be fees. Um, so let's move on to investments, because not only can you optimize the fees, you can optimize what it's actually investment is. Uh, Isabel just says a little bit confuddled the platform fees or both platform and fund. A few people have said that. Claire said added together each. We're talking about both. So platform fees and fund fees together. That was the previous slide that shows you like what's cheap and what's expensive. So it's both together. Cool. Um, so just the, the overall thing is for both of them. So for the platform fees, get it as low as possible. For the fund fees, get it as low as possible. And that's possibly two different like mini projects almost to you know get is. your platform fees as low as you can and then within that get the fund fees as low as you can so don't you don't actually have to overly worry about what it adds up to it's just get them both as low as possible and this is what to think about as it is it being low to does give you an, it does to give you a real life example vanguard's platform fees are 0.15 percent capped at £375 a year. So it's not even 0.15% of everything, it's capped. And then the fund we invest in is called the FTSE Developed World, excluding the UK, and that's 0.14. So the combined total of both is 0.29. So that kind of gives you an idea of where uh, Vanguard SIP would cost for that. I hope that brings to life. Right, let's get on to investments. Here, you're looking to get the fund fact sheet or the key investor document. They are complex documents that are a little bit annoying, <laughs> but we did an entire course on how to read them. So we did a 90 minute workshop on how to read these documents. Uh, watch that worksheet, watch that workshop when you get that fund fact sheet so that you can translate it. Basically, what you want to do is optimize for fees. That's the key thing to optimize for. So if you had two funds they offered, generally just pick the cheaper one. There's a little bit more to it than that. And we wanted to give you the example of active versus passive. 
Uh, there's a famous study that Fidelity did of who got the best returns. And they studied active investors. And what we mean by active is they're trading in and out, they're moving their money, they're doing all this sort of work to get their money working. Uh, and they like analyzed all their different types of investors to passive investors who just put their money in and left it grow. Who do you think did best over the long run? Was it the active investors trading, working, working hard, moving money, putting it into this stock, moving it out? Or was it the people who just put it in and forgot about it and paid the cheapest possible fees? Who did best? Alexandra says passive. Zoe says passive. We kind of set it up for that to be the answer. I think we've kind of made our feelings clear on the matter, haven't we? Claire says active. Uh, D says the one with the lowest fees. It's quite interesting. Active investors were the worst by a long, long way. Uh, the second best investors were people who forgot they had the account because <laughs> they just put the money in and forgot about it and left it to grow. And the best investors were the dead people because they died. They do, accounts are still there just growing in the background and they can't mess with it. So basically, you want to act as if you're dead and just leave your investments to grow without touching them. Optimise them once and then forget about it forever. Yeah, Andy Gibbon says they don't spend much either. That is true. Um, <laughs> but you optimise it and it's really fascinating. It's one of the only games or sports or in the world that the less you do, the better results you get. So once you've done this hard work to optimize it, then you basically put it on, opto on autopilot and just move on. Yeah, so there's the effort up front to fill, you know, we get in our table with our old pensions and understanding what we have in choosing a fund with low fees. But once you've done that, then it's like go and live your life and wait for it to like compound in the background. And maybe you haven't heard the word compounding before. It just means that you get growth on the growth. So your money is growing and any growth that you had last year will grow again. And you might have seen, they call it the hockey stick curve, where it looks like we did it in week one, didn't we? No, it looks like nothing's happening and then it goes Ooh, at the end. We, just to be one more warning on uh, platforms, uh, we looked at, there's a famous one in the UK that's done a lot of promotion recently. They have a big budget to spend on advertising because they charge you a lot. Uh, they're called Wealthify. I did an article called Wealthify or Poorify, and I wrote a letter to the CEO about how bad his investments were doing for everyone. Just be careful because some of these modern companies will get you in, but they're not any better. So what do we actually look for in a fund? Here is what we specifically look for. So to optimize your fund, Katie and I always look for a global tracker fund, index fund, uh, a simple index fund that is invested in over 2000 companies. You want it to invest in a large number of companies so it is diversified. And just to explain a bit more what a global tracker even means is we're not choosing individual companies, we're not choosing individual countries, and we're not we're not either doing that individually ourselves. Like some people think, oh, Apple, they'll do well, I'll buy Apple stocks. Or they'll say, actually, I'm going to get this fancy active manager to figure it out for me. And they choose different companies and things. We're saying, we don't know which companies are going to do well. I'm going to buy each all of them and every company that's available in the world not just the uk because i happen to live in the uk not just in the us because i happen to live in the us or wherever you live around the world this is buying each and every company that exists and you don't have to do that work there are funds that you can buy with you know in one go and say that's what i want to buy and it doesn't pick on industry it doesn't pick on country you're not guessing who's going to do well. It does this thing like mirroring the whole world. So I like to think of it as like if you were going to bet on a horse race, 
you're not trying to get the like tips from your mate who thinks they know what horse is going to do well you're buying every horse in the race you don't care or you own all the horses in the race you don't care which one wins because you have all of them and if one of them one of the horses is struggling and not doing well and not being able to come into competitions you have another horse that back up that will replace it and start to do well as well exactly did that make any sense can we have a an x in the chat or an o in the chat what well, no, x is bad o is good Okay, O means you actually understood what the heck Katie was saying. X means you didn't. Just a couple of comments as well. Tiger says, read the book, Simple Path to Wealth. Yes, Tiger, that is a fantastic book. Jeff says, can I invest a lower amount, hundreds rather than thousands? Yes, Jeff, you can start with tiny amounts and just get going. Uh, and then I really wanted to highlight... Raihan's message. I hope I pronounced your name right. I was wondering about transferring company pension to my SIP, but I'm scared they'll screw things up and cause a ton of hassle. As a general message, fear creates what you are afraid of. What I mean by that is if you are afraid of losing money, people quite often do things which guarantee they lose money. So I'm afraid of it going wrong, therefore I won't do it which means I guarantee I'm not doing as well as I could have done. And that happens all the time. So please, we need to let go of the fear, learn what to do, and then take action towards the key things. Luckily in the chat, we've got mostly O's, Katie, and an awesome we... tips from Natalie, which is amazing. I think all the X ones have probably left by now, possibly. <laughs> uh, right. So there's this thing as well to avoid, which is called home country bias, which the Chancellor of the Exchequer has just started promoting with his extra 5,000 allowance in ISIS. Um, you do not want to over-invest in the country you were born in just because you were born there. That is daft. You just want to mirror the world. So Vanguard has these funds called life strategy funds, which lots of people invest in them. We advise against them massively. We don't advise anything, Alan. We don't advise anything. We say don't use them because they invest over 22% of your money in the UK. And the UK actually only makes up 4% of the global economy. And you want to avoid investing in the country you were born in just because you know it. Avoid it. Uh, invest globally and then the last bit we look for is low fees just wanted to pull on something that zoe said in the chat she said i've read if I, if you have over 30k in a pension you need an advisor to move it because of benefits that might be lost and exit fees what are the benefits and exit fees zoe that is for defined benefit pensions which are where they promise you a certain amount in retirement yes you have to have uh, an advisor if you choose to transfer it elsewhere we're talking tonight mostly about the defined contribution pensions where there is no such requirement and just for complete clarity these are the funds we have invested in. So we wanted to show you exactly what we do. We have a little bit of money in the Vanguard FTSE Global All Cap Index. We have nearly all of our money in the Vanguard FTSE Developed World X UK Index Fund. And then we've just opened a LISA, a lifetime interest, a lifetime individual savings account, and we have some money in the Vanguard FTSE Developed World ETF. Now, you can just pick one of these, but we wanted to be really transparent. This is exactly what we invested in. Katie has put the links in the chat. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I thought you were. I was, and then I got nervous and didn't do it for some reason. Oh, interesting. Why? What made you nervous? I don't know. Okay, we'll, go now. we'll deal with that afterwards. <laughs> uh, so those are the accounts we've actually invested in, and nearly all of our net worth is in the middle one, the Developed World X UK Index Fund. So do people need to buy three different funds? Is no, that they just need one fund. That's all they need is one particular fund. But lots of people go, oh, what if I invest in only one fund? That's not very diversified. Well, the one fund can be incredibly diversified because if you pick, say, the Vanguard global all cap fund that's seven and a half thousand companies in most of the investable countries around the world in every industry you could possibly invest in 
that invest in property and it's one of the most diversified funds you could ever imagine. So there's what we do. So a couple of people have started to say, like, how do I start to invest and where should I look to invest in? I think this is one of those workshops where it's kind of a little bit of knowledge is potentially a dangerous thing. And we can't cover all about investing in this workshop. So if you haven't come on Rebel Finance School, that is I really encourage you to do that when we run it in the summer and to like hold off choosing anything new or start to gather the information you have about your existing pensions and then come to rebel finance school because we we do three sessions on just on investing and we also do that later in the series once we've got the firm solid foundation so that you are ready to invest because there's I don't want to just give you a little bit and then you start without really understanding what it is that we're talking about. So this is just to give you a bit of a flavor to help you to uncover what you already have and think about the sorts of things that you might want to do to optimize it. Because you might be able to find these funds in your current pension advisor. A couple of questions. Alexandra said, will it be available on YouTube? Yes, our Rebel Finance School will be available on YouTube and Zoom. SRF said, why have you added the developed world UCITS ETF to our thing? We did that because in a lifetime ISA, it has lower fees. Um, so they were actually capped for ETFs, but not for index funds. So that would be that's the direct answer to that. It was lower fees. We were trying to minimize our fees. Um Jane, Jack, Mac, Jack May said, what about the 5K extra ISA allowance? Is it still not worth 5K invested in the UK? Jack May, we will not be using that. We will not be investing in 5K directly in the UK. Um, we don't think it's worth it. Uh, Mo Connell says, I'm a bit lost. Is this when you move your pension to invest? Yes, Mo Connell, in your pension, you will have a fund and you will have either chosen that fund or your advisor will have just dumped you into a fund. What we're saying is you need to understand which fund you have in your existing pension and then change it to a different one that's more of a global based one. Uh, Alex Payne says, why Vanguard? Uh, we would like to say we are not <laughs> sponsored by Vanguard. Thank you for the prompt, Alex. We are not sponsored by Vanguard. Did we get commission? I wish. We don't get commission. Um, why Vanguard? Because the guy that founded it is called Jack Bogle. And he was the first person ever to create an index fund. And he worked his entire life to reduce fees to mean more of the profit remains in the investors' pockets. It's an incredible thing he did. And they are an incredible company that seem to have the investors' interests at heart. Their ethos is phenomenal. Please uh, put anything in the chat. I saw some questions coming in. I just want to make sure we answered all of them. So if there's something that we haven't covered, we're not ignoring you, I just missed it. So please re-put your question in the chat, whether you're on Zoom or YouTube, so we can address those. Let me deal with Jack's question. Aren't you putting all your eggs in one Vanguard basket? Jack, Vanguard don't actually have your eggs. Uh, what they do is they take your money and invest it in companies. So, for example, with the global all cap, Vanguard takes your money and splits it among 7,000 companies. So your eggs are in 7,000 different baskets uh, within that one fund. So it's a very different thing. And I think this is the bit where we talk about the fund, the account, sorry, the platform, the account and the fund and the differences between the three. Jeff says, I only have one workplace pension. It's worth about £2,000 and that retirement is estimated to be 15000 when I retire in four years. Should I leave it there? Jeff, that's a slightly more complex answer. We're going to put a link for you or, or send us a message and ask for the link. We did a workshop on uh, forecasting your financial future which actually shows you how to work out those numbers in a little spreadsheet. So it'll help you to create a little spreadsheet. And we did the example for a friend who had a BBC pension and she wanted to work out, would I be better moving it out or keeping it in? And we showed her how to do those figures. I don't, so, I don't think this is necessarily a defined benefit pension. No, neither do I. Okay. But yeah, I think, Jeff, it sounds like, I don't think you've been on 
rebel finance school so i think come on that because we'll talk you through the whole thing and in the meantime i'll put a link in the chat which is um our guide to investing which talks you through all of this all of these concepts that we've touched on tonight in a in much uh sort of more thorough way that we haven't had the time for, to go into detail tonight Exactly. Catherine Ken said, what would you choose? A more diversified fund with 0.5 fees or a less diversified fund with 0.21 fees? Catherine, probably neither. Uh, I would push to find a really broad based index fund that had fees somewhere around 0.2 or less. Uh, and there should be available. So push back at your pension provider and ask them what they have. Find the full list of funds. Really push back at your pension provider to find out what they actually have. Sister G says, I'm soon to be joining the civil service. Which pension is best out of the two, please? Sister G, I have no idea about civil service pensions. Uh, I really can't tell you. You'd have to look up the details. So start with the detective work and then let's chat afterwards and we can have a look at those. I have never used those ones. Cool. Risk rating. We just wanted to talk to you about risk rating and what that actually means. If you ever go and see a financial advisor, they will give you a risk profile questionnaire thing. And one of the questions they basically ask you is, how happy would you be if you lose money? Now, I can't see anyone answering that question. I would be ecstatic to lose money. Lucy, would you go, yes, I would love to lose money. Lucy's laughing. Like, would you actually say that? And here's the thing. What they're actually talking about is volatility. And they say, would you like to lose money? There's two. So look. Let me explain this in a slightly different way. We've written an entire article on this for it to become clear. But risk and volatility. Risk is, will I actually lose money over the long term? And if you invest in index fund over the long term, your chances of losing money are very slim. However, it will be volatile, i.e. the price will go up and down a lot. But over the long term, it always goes up. But when they say would you be comfortable losing money? They then stick you in what's a safer investment or a cautious investment. And this is what they actually did to Katie when she was 25-ish, is they stuck her in a cautious developed fund, a cautious managed fund. Yeah, because they gave me this the questionnaire and said, would you like to lose money? And I said, no, no, I would not. So they decided that I needed to be cautious. Exactly. Uh, so just beware, any fund that has cautious in the title probably is investing you in a bunch of stuff like bonds and different things that you do not need until you're closer to retirement. And this is the simple piece here. If you're in your earning years, i.e. you're earning money, you want all of your money working for you in an index fund. As you come to retirement, you want to transition to having a mix of bonds and stocks and shares. We can't cover this all now, so we're going to do an entire series on this later in the year, which is for the people who are like thinking, OK, I'm coming up to retirement. What should I actually do? If you're in your earning years, like you're 40, 50, you're working, you're not planning on retiring, you want to be in one simple index fund and a stocks and shares index fund. Um, so you just pick a simple, low-cost, global tracker fund. Cool. Uh, highlighting one bit, Catherine said about the two funds. She says she has pushed back, and that was the best of the list. Catherine, are you able to transfer that pension to another provider? Because if we can't get a decent fund, we're actually going to look to transfer, which we're actually coming on to in a bit. If any of this is confusing... You may want to watch the video twice. You may want to come on Rebel Finance School, or this is an article we wrote all about investing where you can find all of this stuff in text. Sometimes we have to hear the messages in different ways several times before it really starts to sink in. And we will be doing the whole Rebel Finance School in the summer. Uh, so if you want to, 
sign up to our mailing list and you will be told when that will be run. It's probably May or June will actually run, but we'll send you an email when it's coming out. Is this a massive upsell that like we're giving this workshops for free and then we're like coming in at the end and going, give us millions of pounds and we'll teach you more. Is this what this is about, Alan? Uh, no, I wish it was, um, but this is free. You wish it was? I don't know. I'd like to have millions more. And I could spend it on pineapples. But anyway, Rebel Finance School is completely free. Uh, all the courses we do are completely free for you. Um, so just like there is no upsell. This is just other content we have provided for you. So how is it free? Like that doesn't make sense. Why would it be free? You don't get anything for free, do you? Uh, it's free because we reached financial independence about five years ago. And we have sorted out our finances and we've made it our mission in retirement to help other people sort out their finances. So I, you, Lucy and Catherine and Lauren and Davinda and everyone, we want to help you with your finances. And it just makes us happy that we're valuable in the world. So that's why we do it. We give it all away. But then on Monday evenings and on Tuesday morning, I jump out of bed excited to write more articles and help people because like we just... This is our jam, baby. We just love it. So that's why we're a bit weird, but we want to help. Exactly. And Alex, you're exactly right. If I did have more money, I would buy more Lego. Definitely. Uh, okay. We're going to move on to the next little bit, which is matched contributions. Uh, and the question is, are you turning down free money? This is one of my favourite photos we took in the photo shoot, which is basically me waving money at Katie in a park in Bogota as she runs away. Uh, are you turning down free money? Your employer, if you have a job, is legally obliged to contribute to your pension. And quite often what happens is... The pensions will be if you put in 5%, your employer will put in 5%. Or if you put in 4%, your employer will match it and put in 4%. What we need to know is what's the maximum matched contributions your employer will put in. And then make sure you're taking all of that free money. So go back to your employer and say, if I contribute 5% of my salary, will you put in 5%, 6%, 7%, like as much as possible? Never leave that free money on the table. Take as much of it as you can. So go and understand what they will contribute to your pension. And that will only be with your current employer. I've never heard of it still being happening if, with previous employers. No, it's I mean, a current if, employer. If that only. happened, that'd be amazing. Be like, well, Katie's left, but we're still going to keep paying her. It doesn't really work like that. It's just for your current one. So there's been lots of questions about providers. Let's just look at providers. So the question is, are you happy with your current provider? D said Nest, that's the first one on our list. Nest is one of the biggest providers of pensions in the UK with about 8 million people having an account with them. There's Scottish Widows, Nutmeg, Vanguard, Aviva, St. James's Place, Avoid at All Costs, uh, Vanguard. There's loads of different providers. Here's the reasons why you would change Number one, you would change provider if the fees are too high. Number two, you would change provider if it's actively managed and they will not allow you to have a simple index fund. Which normally those two go hand in hand because actively managed funds have high fees. Exactly. Uh, number three, you might change, like I think it was Kate saying, I've gone to them and they've given me these two funds and they're not that great. You might change if you can't get a decent fund with your existing pension provider. Which the sort of the balance with that is that you're getting that free money from your employer as well. So there is that thing to think of as well. And number four is it was an old pension, old employer that you want to consolidate it. So you might actually want to think about consolidating it from that. Or another way of saying that is to simplify it and have it all in one place rather than having bits and bobs all over the place. Exactly. And just I had to read this one out from the chat. Resma said, I did the first Rebel Finance course and it has completely changed my financial future. Pensions took a while to sort out and transfer into Vanguard. I can breathe now. Thank you, guys. I love that. 
That's all we want is for you to take this information and do something about it. So ways to change, got two broad ways. Number one is of your existing pension providers, choose the one you like the most and then like transfer everything into that one. Or you might open a SIP, a Vanguard SIP or something like that, and then you transfer all the old pensions into the Vanguard SIP and you take control yourself. A SIP is a self-invested personal pension. And all that basically means is you are in charge. You control what it's invested in, your control when it comes out, all of those different things. D says, is it worth consolidating? The answer is, what are your fees of your current provider? It's the same things, like what are the fees? What are you invested in? Like, there's no point consolidating if it's already good. Um, and Claire says, how do you find this stuff out? Phone the pension platform for the employer. Like you're going to have to phone the pension platform or log into the pension platform and find out all the details. One quick warning is when people are looking for new pension providers, quite often they see adverts for people like Nutmeg, who have a very big advertising budget and they look a very swanky website, uh, but they charge high fees and they don't give you access to good pensions. Like beware some of the like really beautifully designed websites. It doesn't mean they're good because they have pretty pictures of people in camper vans. That's not going to be your future if you go with them. It always comes back to what are the fees and what can you invest in? And that's why we warn people off Nutmeg and Pension B and Wealthify because the fees are high and the investments are not that great generally. Exactly. Uh, so a little warning is... If you're thinking about moving pensions, just check to see what benefits they're giving you at your existing pension. If it's a defined benefit pension, be very careful. Check all the details because we've mainly been talking about defined contribution. And a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Like make sure you fully understand the funds, the fees and all the details before moving it really need to understand these details. Don't do it on a whim. Um, Rahina says, Royal London has a profit share that seems not very transparent. Do you know much about it? Watch the... Um, how to read your pension statement. How to read your pension statement where we actually go through a profit share scheme. We're not big fans. Uh, I think you're... You the other way it's called is with profits. Um, and we did an example on that. And Alex says, what are your thoughts on standard life? Alex, it will always come back to the question. What are the fees? What are the investments that are available? Like you, you're going to get sick of us saying that because that's the answer to everything. What are the fees? What yeah. are the investment funds that are available? What are you already invested in? That's it over and over again. So any, we want to train you to start thinking that way for yourselves. It's like, okay, well, what do, what do I think about standard life? Let me look up what their fees are. Let me look up what I'm currently invested in. That's our answer to everything. Well, not everything. <laughs> that yeah. sort of question. How do you improve your relationship? <laughs> Check the fees. No. There aren't any fees involved. Platform fees or fund fees? <laughs> life what fees. Level, what level of thinking are we at, Anna? Moving on quickly. Beware exit fees. This is actually what got St. James's Place in trouble. They had 6%. Yes, you heard me correctly. 6% exit fees that tailed off. They would steal 6% of your money if you moved. Just beware of exit fees. And then a very key bit here, which some of you have been asking. Yeah. So you're saying like, oh, should I change? Should I consolidate? Well, not necessarily. So when we learned about investing and understood about passive investing versus active investing and sacked our swanky financial man that charged us stupid amounts of money, we we're like, well, OK, let me look at what I already have. So I worked at Deloitte and I wanted to understand the, what we just told you to do. What are the fees and what is it invested in? So I looked and I had low fees and it was in a good low cost broad based index fund. It was actually a Vanguard fund underneath it. So I was like, well, okay, I don't need to do anything. It's in a good place. It's, I like where it's invested. And that's what I've done with my Deloitte pension. And it's, it's still there. My pot is still there separate from all our other stuff because it's good. 
there's no need to change if necess- it's good necessarily we're not saying up in arms get your pitchforks and go and change and <laughs> change your provider you don't necessarily have to if you find that it's good just leave it where it is who administers the deloitte pension for me it's standard life i assume they still use standard life yeah so Standard Life is actually the one, because Alex said, what about Standard Life? Yeah, and Casey's see, pension is with Standard Life. Um, so you see, I avoided giving my direct answer and made Alex go and do some work. But it just depends. So within Standard Life, just find out what the fees are. Find out which fund you have it invested in. I almost by chance had chosen a good fund before understanding any of this. Then when I went to look back, when I did understand it, I was happy with what I had. So it's that combination of what do I think of the platform, the standard life, and what do I think of the funds underneath it as well? It's those two elements combined. And there are changes coming, which is mm. very exciting mm. for us. Mm. Changes. There is something called the Pension Pot for Life Reforms, which if this goes through, when it goes through the government, will make things so much easier for everyone, you, me, everyone. And the idea behind this is you can have one pension pot for life. And when you switch jobs, you can then ask your new employer to pay into your old pension pot. So you can ask your employer to pay into a different pension pot and you don't have to go into the standard pension scheme. It's not out yet, but it's coming. In the future, you won't have to accept like NEST or the standard scheme, you will be able to say, I want you to contribute to my Vanguard SIP, my this, my that, which will be incredible. You can opt out of your company pension right now and take control yourself, but you will be missing out on matched contributions and free money. That is huge. So we wouldn't really do that you would take the free money and then maybe partially transfer it out every now and again or take the money whilst you work there and transfer it out later it is also possible right now to ask your employer to contribute to a different pension scheme however your employer is not legally propelled obliged obliged to say yes But that doesn't mean you can't ask and you can't negotiate with them. So you can definitely negotiate with them. But when this comes in, the pension pot for life reforms, it will make things a lot easier, a lot easier. Okay. There's a lot more to go through and I've got a lot more questions. We have a couple of bits for you before we go on. Uh, I'm feeling quite happy because D Smith says, I feel happy and I have a much better understanding and feel confident addressing this now, which is awesome. Uh, If you don't yet feel that way, we will work with you to go through it and do it. If you work for any of these employers, do you work for Legoland, Merlin or Abri? If you do, please put the word Lego, Merlin or Abri in the chat. We just want to know because they shared these workshops. We just want to know, did anyone who lives in one of their houses, works for the Housing Association, come along? So please put that in the chat. It would mean the world to us because then we can actually say to them, yes, your staff and tenants came along and we were able to help. So if you do work for them, please put it in the chat. And if you're watching on Catch Up, please put in a comment. We would love that. Thank you so much. Now, the steps. We wanted to make this a process. So this is the slide to take a photo of and to have at the end. Um, Steps to taking control. Number one, find out the matching deal with your current employer. That's critical. Know what they are matching. Next, create a table of all your pension plots from previous employers where we had like, what is the provider? What are the fees? All of that fun stuff. And it can start to get overwhelming when you once you've got that table and you're like, what do I do with it now? So where would you start? Uh, for each pot, we're going to review the fees and the funds. And if you had to optimise for one thing, it would be fees. If you're feeling a little bit like, what do I do at this stage? The best thing you can do is share it in the Rebel Finance School Facebook group and ask for feedback and thoughts on the different things. Then... We have the entire Rebel Finance School coming up in May or June, 
that we will run for you, that we will step by step take you through investments all the way from the start, all the way through. So we are here to support you along the way. And then the final step after we've understood all of this is to consider moving provider or changing investments. Once we've understood it, that's what we need to do. So those are the clear steps that we want to go through taking control of our pensions and what we're doing, because you need to be in control. You need to be in control. So before we've got a little bit more content coming up in a second, before we do that, we've got the key question, which I would love you, please fill this one in. Um, the simple question is, before the course, did you feel confident in knowing the step to take control of your pension? And after the course, or if you've done our courses before, do it before the Donnegans, did you feel Free confident? Donnegans. Free Donnegans, did you feel confident knowing and understanding the steps to take control of your pension? And afterwards, if you're on YouTube, Jeff, before you go, everyone on YouTube, please fill this out. This is what the funder of these workshops, the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead and the wonderful Saloni need us to collect to be able to get the cash, to be able to pay, to do the courses and give them all away because it takes a lot of energy and time to do this. So please fill that in, put a comment, let us know you've done it. If you're on YouTube, please tell us you've done it, but fill this in, fill out the QR code. You've got the QR code or it's in the chat. Um, if you're in Zoom, please fill this out now. We've had 69% of people on Zoom fill it out. Uh, that's not high enough. Please, who, <laughs> who's not filled it out? Lucy, was it you? You looked like you were doing... No, Lucy's like, I did it. Excellent. Two, two of them are you and me, so... Davinda, have you finished your food? Have you filled out the form? SRF, have you done it? If you're listening, please fill this out. We really, really appreciate it. Claire says done. Alexandra says done. That's awesome. Uh, we'll have to poke the other people in a bit. So we've got a little bit more to give you, then we'll go into Q&A. So we've got one, a couple more thoughts, haven't we, for you? So in this series of workshops, we have one more. Is it one more after tonight? It's one more next week. These numbers and spreadsheets can be overwhelming can't they like there's there's all these numbers floating around and you come across numbers in your everyday life and you think how do I make the decisions that I need to make or maybe you just make a snap decision because it feels overwhelming we're going to go through lots of examples of how to use numbers in your everyday life how to use spreadsheets in your everyday life to help you make those sorts of decisions that before got you overwhelmed and that's the whole idea around that last workshop which I will be leading and have Alan in the chair uh, on Monday at exactly. 8 o'clock. And there's a reason why Katie's got a whip in that picture because she's <laughs> whipping into control the spreadsheet. I'm, it's not just a bondage whip. Yeah, reference. I'm like mastering something. Aren't exactly. I? I am the master of spreadsheet. Yeah, Claire likes it. So after that workshop, you will obviously feel just like this with your spreadsheets and numbers. That's how I feel every day, Alan, when I think about numbers. Exactly. Uh, okay, five. Am I going to make it to retirement? Now, if you have got past the age of 18 to 21, you have made it through what they call the accident hump, which is where lots of young people get drunk and crash cars and die. So if you've got past the 18 to 21 accident hump, your chance of making it to old age is very high. Lucy, you will be old, um, which is good. So I actually went to the government calculator and asked it how long I would live. Uh, and according to the latest stats, I will live to 84 on average, if on average. I like to look, think I look after my health, so maybe longer. But I have a one in four chance of making it to 93, a one in 10 chance of making it to 98, but only a 5.3% chance of making it to 100. I think I'll make 100. I really do. I'm looking after myself. Are you bragging here? What's this about, Ellen? I don't know. What I'm saying to you is you're probably, if you're on this workshop and you live in the Western world, you're probably going to live a long time. So you need to take control of your pensions. And we also wanted to say, don't just assume you have to work until retirement age. Like if you're 60 and you get this stuff right, you might be able to retire at 64 or 65. That's still four or five years. 
younger than the average person in the UK. Like, would you like to buy back four or five years of life to do whatever you want to do with? And you might be able to buy your freedom. And Katie and I always talk about this is buy your freedom first. Instead of buying stuff, buy freedom to do whatever you want to do with your life. Because one of the greatest things in our life was being able to like formally retire at 35 years old and 40 years old so that we can actually spend our life doing what we want to. So we're here on the beach in Mexico running a workshop on pensions. Like most people are going, you're crazy. This is what you want to do with your retirement. I love it. Lucy looks a bit confused. You're doing what in retirement? Why aren't you on the beach? We are. And we're running pension workshops because it's fun and we get to help people. And the buy your freedom first stuff, the example we always have is, would you like a BMW or five years of your life to do anything you want? Because it's really fascinating. Buying a fancy car versus retiring early is not something people think about, but it's a choice people are actively making. And that's why we drove a tiny little car. We had a Skoda Citigo and we bought our freedom first. So if you optimize your pensions, if you do this work to take control, you could buy back years of your life. All of the concepts are going to come up in Rebel Finance School. Sign up to the mailing list if you want to actually find out when that is. No one is coming to save you. I hate to break this to you, Lucy. I hate to break this to you, Davinda. No one is coming to save you. You have to do it for yourself. And if you want a comfortable retirement, you're going to have to take control of these things. Your future is in your hands. What are you going to do with it? And I want you to have a bright financial future so you're free to do anything you want to do. That's what we care about. So just start. Do the things now that future you will say thank you for. Because for Katie and I, we are so grateful to younger Katie and Alan, who did a lot of work on pensions like, we love those guys. They looked after us. So please do something now that future you will go, oh, I love younger Lucy. She did me proud by going on these workshops. I love younger Davinda. He did me proud by fixing my pensions. Like, do something right now to get on top of it. And Claire said, when did we start? We found out about financial independence uh, when... I was, there, where was it? The year was 2014, 2014. So we found out in 2014, that's when we really started to take charge. And then our real progress came from like 2016 onwards. Um, yeah. And Claire says, if we're 57 now with no savings at all, is there hope? Uh, Claire, there is no hope. What I mean by that is don't hope. Let's actually take control. Let's actually do something. Claire, you can always improve your finances. And for everyone listening to this, I do not care where you're starting from. If you're 65, about to retire next year, we can still improve where your pensions are invested, what you're doing. You have no savings. We can still get better. So, Claire, you are in great shape. We can make this better. We can make progress. So I don't care how old you are, where you're starting, you can improve your finances. And that's what we're here to help you do. Katie nodded. Excellent. So that's it. Uh, that's the end of this particular bit of the workshop. We're going to answer questions in the Zoom. So if you're on the YouTube, please come over to the Zoom if you want to ask us a question. Uh, Thank you for coming on the workshop. If you're on the YouTube right now, thank you for coming. Thank you for watching this. Please take control of your financial future for us because uh, we would love to help you so you can have an incredible financial future. Thank you to everyone for attending. We will end the YouTube now and then we will come back for questions on Zoom. Goodbye, everyone on YouTube. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Raina. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye, YouTube. And there we go. YouTube.